Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 1871 podcast. And on this episode, I'm delighted to say that our special guest is former Reading winger and Reading legend, Glenn Little. So, Glenn, thank you for joining us. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Yeah, it's just a shame we haven't, no, it's under these circumstances, we haven't got something exciting to talk about looking at next season. Just it's a shame how sort of the last few months went and it ended up being a bit of a disaster in the end and we're sort of in League One now. So it hasn't really sunk in yet, has it? I suppose you won't until the fixtures come out and then you start seeing Lincoln and Port Vale. That's when it will dawn that we're back yeah. in League One. <laughs> And it's nice, it's nice, Glenn, to hear you say we. That's always a, a good sign that you still feel kind of connected to the club. And, and obviously, you know, you're a part of the 106 season, Reading's first Premier League season. And it's actually quite a long time ago now, but, um, you know, it, it probably still, still has some great memories for you. It probably still feels like yesterday, doesn't it, in a way? Yeah. It, it, well, it's just incredible, really, when you think we're, we're sort of, was it 16, 17 years now, just, and and how well it went, uh, having the time of your life, and yeah, I can remember so much about it, we, well, I could tell you every game we scored, and, <laughs> and it was just an incredible season where we we, we had that, um, the first season I was there, we, we should have been in the playoffs, we were in the playoffs the whole season, and just missed out on the final day at Wigan, and that, that to have them celebrating in front of us, and that that really did that that really did hurt. Long journey back from Wigan on the coach and very quiet as as you'd imagine. We were sort of watching them, thinking that could have been us, but we blew it. Come back the next season, lost the first game to Plymouth. Who knew? Eh? <laughs> thinking here we go. Yeah. That, what what a bad start that is. Injury time, defeat to Plymouth, who you probably looked at one of the worst teams, and and then here here we go, thirty three games unbeaten and. That was pretty much job done. That's it. And, and I want to take you back, Glenn, to your um, time before Reading and, and when you joined Reading. So uh, you'd been playing at uh, Glen Torren. Um, then you were at Burnley, I think, for seven years. And you actually joined Reading on loan at first, didn't you, in 2003? And then you, uh, uh, you joined sort of on what they call a permanent basis in 2004. What do you remember about that initial loan spell at, at Reading? Well, it just came out of nowhere, really. I just got a phone call. We weren't doing anything at, at and Burnley. We were safe and just, it was a nothing sort of season. Lot, lots going on off the pitch financially. If you can remember, it was the I to be digital. Hurt a lot of clubs and it really affected us. So we were basically just trying to get through the season. And and so we, we had a couple of cup runs that, that kept us going, that sort of got the deficit, really. I think it, the club was losing between half a million to a million pounds, but the cup saved us. And so you just thought, right, see out the season and then got the phone call, Alan Pardew. And so now, now you're thinking, right, I'm, I'm signing for a team in the playoffs. I thought the season was over. And then there you go, the excitement. Never been in the playoffs before. So it's just great opportunity. And it was just a shame, wasn't it? I, I can remember the, the first leg in particular. I wasn't well a couple of days before. At, it was away, wasn't it, at Molyneux. And we got off to a great start. I think it was Foz scored, but yeah, then got injured yeah. after about 20 minutes, went off. And it still looked like we were going to win 1-0. And it was the two goals in the last 15 minutes totally turned turned the tide round. But then at home, we were the better team again. Couldn't get the goal and just they, they scored late on to really finish us yeah. off. But yeah, it was definitely a case of what might have been over the two legs. What was it? 180 minutes. We were probably the better team for about 160 of them. But as Reading know, I don't have to tell you about the the playoffs, do I? And, <laughs> and yeah, and we were going to be a few years later. It was going to happen again to, to Burnley, my old club again, Burnley. And, and obviously, we're going to talk about the one hundred and six season and that first season in in the Premier League. But um, you you joined in John Reading in, in two thousand and four. Um, I just want to ask you because you you got you, you've got your Blakey nickname, haven't you? Um, yeah, and, and you are—you've got a reputation as being one of the characters in in that dressing room, and and everyone kind of looks at you, and you you've got that banter with all the players. Just, just wonder, Glenn, which players when you first arrived at Reading did you sort of get on well with straight away? Well, I I knew on loan when I first signed on loan. Luckily, um, Ricky Newman was there. 
who I'd grown up with as a kid at Palace. There was John Solarco, also who I knew. So it was easy to fit in. I, I can remember c- coming down because uh, a good thing for it, I don't know whether you know, but my mum lived about 45 minutes away n- near Wimbledon. So so for, for Reading, I came and stayed at um, my mum's. And so it was only for about six weeks to the end of the season. Yeah, my mum probably wasn't happy with that. My mum and dad, me turning up. But it, it was after a couple of weeks as well. You, you'll remember this name. And he, he was getting up about five o'clock in the morning, getting trains and trying to get to. Then it was the Bradford College we, we trained at. And he, he realised, he said, Glenn, uh, uh, where, where are you coming in from? I said, Wimbledon. And um, he lived about two minutes around the corner from my mum's, but Baz Savage. Oh, yeah. So yeah, for yeah, those yeah. six weeks, Baz Savage, you couldn't believe it. He said, oh, I'm, I'm, I can actually have a lie-in and I, I just go around <laughs> in the morning, pick him up about half eight and we, we drive hours to training. So he was delighted for those six weeks, Baz Savage. And um, so he, he was a good lad. And then AD, if I did have a night before a game in a hotel, AD, as you'd imagine, the skipper, good, good sort of experienced player, AD, he'd say, Glenn, come round for dinner. So he'd look after you. So, yeah, settled in straight away. And then once the playoffs were done, I still had a year left at Burnley. And Alan Padre did actually ring me. He wanted to sign me, but he said, I can't afford the wages. So I had a year left. And, and so that was that. I thought, OK, I'll go back to Burnley, f- fin- finish off the, the contract, and then I'll see what happens. And then you, you you start the season. He leaves, doesn't he? And gets put on the garden and leave, goes to West Ham. So then you, you're thinking, right, but Reading's off the table. But... Who comes in? Steve Coppel, someone who I go back so such a long time with, my favourite player growing up. But obviously, being born in Wooden, you, you grew up a Manchester United fan. And Steve Coppel, the right winger, my favourite player, was a kid at Palace from nine years old. And, and then you never got the chance to play for me. He left, I think it was uh, the, the Premier League, probably when I was 18, 17, 18, we got relegated. He leaves. And then again, you're thinking, that's it. I'll never play for Steve Coppel. So it was great that 10 years later, end up going to Ireland, going to Burnley. He went to Brentford, I think it was, and and Brighton. So I kept coming up against him. But then when he got the job, it was again, OK, right, this is interesting. Like Cops has got the job. And then it was all sort of pretty much done January, February time that the, that the, the, the sort of phone call I had. I met him in a hotel, actually, when... Burnley, we went down to play Crystal Palace and we stayed at the Pearly Way Hotel. Cops came down the Friday night, spoke to him then and, and it was him and Stan Turner. It was actually my Burnley managers that just said, if if Glenn leaves Burnley, his, his contract's up. If he doesn't stay, then what about signing for the Cops? And so that that was it really. It, I, I had about four or five other clubs interested, but it was just that the opportunity to come back to Reading, who I knew as well. I thought, I know the club, I'm not going to have to settle in and plan for the Cops. It it, it was just a, a great opportunity and lots of pluses. C- coming back home as well, closer to home. And I think it's fair to say, you, like I said, when when you have decisions to make, uh, four or five clubs, you got to make the right choice. And I think it's fair to say I did. Yeah, absolutely. John, are you going to bring you in now? Yeah, I like I'm going to speak to you again. Like Steve Coppel, for you, what what was he as a manager? Like we've heard so much about him, but like you know, you, you he was your hero as a player. Slightly different kind of style as wingers, maybe a bit quicker than you. Is that fair to say? A bit, a bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was six foot three, and he was five foot three. So I, I can remember once we were having a chat because you, you think of what he did. Yeah. Uh, it, it's only years later where you, you realise that. I, I was just a kid and when he got the, the job at Palace, it was my local team. I was 10 minutes down the road and just uh, got the opportunity to, to meet him and I went down there. You don't realise he was 27 yeah. when, when he took the job. He, he retired 26, 44 England caps. So you're probably looking at you're going to and 70, 80 England caps he would have had and that was in the days where you weren't playing the, the, the Estonias and Andorras and and San Marino's people like that. So yeah, great player. But as a as a winger, you, you expect him to give me tips, wouldn't you? Maybe sort of tell you, look, maybe try this, do that. But he never gave me any advice. Or, and and I can remember talking to him about it. 
and and he just said, "What am I going to tell you what to do?" I, I, and he, he sort of said, you, "I couldn't play like you. You're, you're six foot three. and <laughs> and he, he said, "I had just this one trick." He said, "I used to do this one trick where sort of stop and go and and stop with one foot, take it with the other foot." And he said, "So what what can I tell you what to do?" Which so he, he was right, really. We were just sort of just totally the opposite. But yeah, just it for 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 him to to sort of be at Reading and, and for, for to come in anyway, the, the respect I had for him anyway, again, he, he's your favourite player. You looked up to him, just the, the pictures on, on the wall, we signed the pictures and then to, to, to play for him was great. But then to do that, what we did as well and, and win promotion with the, the record points, take that into the Premier League, that, that, that was just, again, just an experience that you, you have in the time of your life. Were you still, you? Were you still a fan? A Steve Koppel fan at Reading, you didn't get him to sign any pictures when you were. No, no, do, do you know what? Yeah. But what what the, the boys didn't know is that when I grew up at Palace, he could actually train, and even though he, he couldn't play, but he used to join in the training sessions, and he was the best player at Palace. Just his delivery, just it was on a sixpence. He's crossing, and that's one thing I didn't really model myself on on players. Strangely enough, some of my favourite players, even though I was a big United fan. Some of my favourite players were, were Tottenham players, and it, and it was Glenn Hoddle, Chris Waddle, and and the big one Gaza. So they were players who maybe I, I looked at. Hoddle was one who, who again, a bit lazy. People would say lazy, no pace. Waddle was sort of similar, wasn't he? he? Looked like he was knackered after ten minutes, and you get the ball and beat two or three people. So there was bits and pieces that you, you took off other players, and and Koppel was one where just the delivery that cross just that half a yard and he'd, he'd always pick someone out. And and it was just a shame that by the time I got to Reading, I think he'd probably had about 25 knee operations. The, 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 the boys there didn't even see him in a pair of boots. He, he couldn't even join in the little circle before the start of training. So I actually got to see him in action because what people might not know as well, when I was at Palace, I broke my leg twice at 15 and 16. So I was out for two years. And so the first season at Palace as an apprentice, I just spent it behind the goals, getting all the balls in and getting in the bushes, freezing, freezing cold. But I just got to watch training every day. And and just to see him, it, it, it was unbelievable. Everyone knew it. Like every, it was sort of a bit of a joke at Palace. You say, who's the best player at Palace? And people you say, Ian Wright, no. Jeff Thomas, no. Andy Gray, Mark Bright. Well, who then? Steve Koppel. He was still the best in training. and But by the time I got to Reading, those knees, they were long gone. He couldn't even get a pair of football boots on. He used to stand on the, the touchline in the moon boots and, and the wellies and ne- never really even took the training. It was all Wally and, and Dill. The, the, the big um, plus I would give him, though, is just putting the team together. You, you talk about just the jigsaw puzzle and, and identifying players and how many signings we had free transfers I was a free transfer you look at um, the Superman songs don't you there was kits a bit of money not a lot of money but kits then the Kevin Doyle and and the, the list keeps going didn't you Leroy was again bit bit of money Leroy but at a time it was still a gamble wasn't it it was it was good money for us but it was someone who had only really played a couple of seasons that, that was in league one hadn't even played in the championship but so many successes. If you said who who's the best signing, Steve Coppell signing, it'd be tough to pick one. Johnny, go on. Yeah, no, and no, I was just saying, guys, it's really like I just it just takes us back to the, the those days, and and like you were in that change room with those lads, like you like obviously you're a different. We you had Bobby Convey as a player who came out of the blue, really, didn't he? It was a totally different when you see. Yeah, he was probably a bit more like Steve Coppell. In the way that he's quick and and do whatever, but you all you all fed off each other, didn't you, as players? Yeah, yeah. We used to talk about the combinations all, yeah. all over the pitch, and everyone knew the jobs. We were a team as well. If if you can remember this team, it, I always used to say, a team it takes sort of three years to to build, yeah. and we were on. We, we finished seventh, didn't we? Look, uh, I think even before I come that. It was seventh, wasn't it, with Pardew? Just missed out. I come the first season seventh, and then we started to tweak it. And then you, you've got the the Murty had still been there. Shorey was still there. Marcus, you you had that core. Siddy, Harps, and then all of a sudden, I came with Bobby, Sonks as well. Then, then it was um, 
Nick Nicky, four star and kits up front. Foz leaves, who was a big player for us. Yeah. yeah. But with, with Coppel, something just wasn't quite right towards the end. And and then Foz left, and you're thinking, who, who are we going to play now? You find that them um, Kevin Doyle signed Leroy and it all just comes together and it was it was sort of three years in the making wasn't it and then it all it all came together you look at me and Mertz on the right Bobby and Shorey on the left Sidney and Arps Sonks and Ivor and those three up front and when... they all sort of had turns in and out weren't they because yeah, it, it, yeah. it was strange how it worked out in a season I've never seen anything like it you, you talk about a special season but it is luck as well how it all comes together where I think when Kitts got injured, Doyle came in. Yeah. And then Kitts was injured for a bit. And then as soon as he came back, L- and Leroy got injured, broke his ankle, I think it was, up yeah. at Burnley. So it was just, uh, it would have been a tough one. I don't know whether you've ever asked Steve Coppel this, but if you had to pick the two out, the three, who, if everyone was fit, who he would have gone for, very difficult. He never, he never said because he didn't have the problem. <laughs> no, no, didn't, that, again, never had the problem. And then even when we were in the Premier League, wasn't it? Kitts injured the first game of the season, yeah. and he, he did his knee in, against Borough. Scored, yeah. did his knee, and was out for six, seven months. And then it was Lee Roy. They, they all had spells where they were all on fire, weren't they? And they all sort of took it in turns. I, I've got a feeling that if he had to pick it, he would have gone for. Hits and Doyle. Who would you though, Glenn? If like uh, as a as a winger, who was your player? If you had to pick two out of those four, that was like, ah, oh, this is I can put the ball in for these guys. The one that suited your style of play. Uh, do, do you know what they they, they, they all did, didn't they? Okay. If uh, I'm sure, if you look back and and yeah. see me setting up about 114 goals for a ball, <laughs> I think <you'd, laughs> I think you, just 114. You, they, they all scored, didn't they? And, and even Leroy, because you'd think hits in the air, wouldn't you? Putting yeah. the crosses in, you'd think, but. But Doyle could get up and head it in. And Leroy was only uh, small, but Leroy could score with his head as well. So that they were all different, weren't they? Yeah. That Doyley was the all action, I'd say here, there, and everywhere. Kicks was the the taller, sort of stronger bit, but but not your real target man. He, he wasn't. He, he could play on the deck as well, left yeah. and right foot kicks in the air. And Leroy was your electric around the box, wasn't he? He was your pure finisher, your natural finisher. Yeah. And then Shane and, Long when you needed someone. And, and then Longy again, the youngster who come in fourth choice, Longy, yeah. and and how well Longy could do if if you could throw Longy on for twenty minutes. And and Longy probably out of all the players I played with, he he, he improved more than anyone. I, I always used to believe that you, you've either got it or you haven't. You, you can work on your fitness. You can you, you can work work on your left foot, right foot. You can practice. But you, you need that talent. You've either got it or you haven't. And Longy was someone, when he first signed, I think he was there a week and he had to go. He, he had to oh. um, just get sort of moved over with the youth team. It was, no, he can't train with us. He he, he was really bad. And <laughs> and then he came back about six months later. He went over with Eamon Dolan. Of course. And about six months later, we were absolutely flying I think it was Kitts got injured and, he, and it just that game at Derby. He came in from nowhere, got a player sent off, scored the equaliser and never looked back. The improvement with Longy w- was incredible and, and actually had the best career probably out of us all, didn't he? Only just finished maybe, has he? I, I saw something come up, is he? Yeah. Just calling it a day yeah. long. Yeah, lovely for him to, to come back, like, to come back where it started. Unfortunately, he did, didn't get the goals to to help us this season. But yeah, great career, Longy. And, and like I said, I, I'd never seen someone improve so much as him. And that's all down to his work ethic. Yeah. Just that that will, that that attitude, the character to, to do what he did. And Glenn, enough, just, um, Glenn, just asking you about your particular style as a, a winger, because, you know, if you think of wingers, you think of people like Steve Koppel. Let, let's just say with you, you had... As a winger, you had a, quite a unique, sort of unorthodox yeah. style, <laughs> and I think yeah, just that, a bit. that worked worked well with the opposition because because you they, they they probably didn't know how to play against you because you weren't the quickest, but you had you had that knack of of beating players. How how, yeah. you know, how did you develop that style? Or did it just come naturally to you? Well, I, I actually, I was actually a centre midfielder growing up from about nine and all the way to 
to sort of Palace. And it was only when I, I went to Glen Tor and I started the first couple of games as a centre midfielder. And then I did them a favour, just do a job. Can you just fill in for a game? Filled in. And three games later, I think it was man in a match in every game. And, and that was it. it. So it became a case of, it, at Glen Tor, the manager, Tommy Cassery, it, it, he said, do what you want, left or right. It was basically just play where you want. If you can feel you can rip the left back to pieces, play on the right. If you can rip the right back to pieces, play on the left. And so it was a lot of freedom. I was only about 19 and I thought, here we go. This is good. The manager's telling me to just go out and, and do what I want. So it was great. And, and that really helped. Go, going out there was fantastic just to, to learn the game and, and play man's football, playing against grown men and yeah. experienced players, tough pitches as well. Once that weather came in, in, in Northern Ireland, having to play on, Sort of heavy pitches and and people trying to kick you. So it 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 was great for me to go out there and learn the game and and then have a bit of success as well. And then to take that to Burnley and and so when I went to Burnley, it was the same. They just put me on on the wing and 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 that was it. But I, I always sort of saw myself as a centre midfield player that that I, I took pride in keeping possession more than anything. And a lot of people all, would always say about, oh, he's running with it, taking players on. And and people talk about the chop I had. But it was the, the first thing, again, it was always keep the ball, don't lose the ball. And then I was able to carry the ball, run with the ball and just had the quick feet as well. It also helped a lot of the, the fullbacks you were playing against were half your size as well. It was just the, the way it was. And unless you played against Herman Horidison, <laughs> I always had always had the height and the weight advantage. Although, like, you know what I'm like at heading the ball, that that probably didn't help much. <laughs> and uh, and Glenn, just want to ask you, you: you mentioned him earlier. You talked quite a bit about Steve Coppel, and and you mentioned Wally Downs. Obviously, you know another character, um, and and you need that when you've got a successful team. What what was it like working with Wally Downs? What what was he really like? Well, again. Going, he's going back to the Palace days. I, I grew up with Wally and I think it's fair to say I wasn't exactly his favourite. We, we had a couple of run-ins at Palace and when he actually left, I was actually happy. I thought, well, there you go. Because I think one of the last things Wally said to me, I, I, I was outside and getting a bit of treatment and there was about four or five of us, the injured lads, a lovely sunny day, we're out there and and there was a player called Jewel Gendar. I don't know if you remember him, Wolves yeah. winger. And Wally's son had come in for the date. And I think it's fair to say he was a right little, he was a shitbag, he was. And he, he came in, he was mucking about and, and he was aggravating everyone. And he, I think he, he jumped on George's back. And and he, as he ran off, I just picked up a, a bit of an ice cube out of the ice bucket and I threw it at him. It, it didn't half catch him in the back of the head. And he started crying and he, he ran round to get his dad. I said, like, oh, I better get out of here. So I'm hiding in the gym and Wally came in. He's like, who did it, son? Who threw that ice cube at you? And he said, there he is. He pointed at me and he just came in. And he said, he said, um, how many broken legs you had? And I said, two. And, and he said, I, he said, you wait till you come back. I'll add to that. So I thought, oh, I've got an enemy here in Wally. And... And luckily, by the time I come back, he'd, he'd been sacked. So he'd left. So I thought, I thought, oh, that's Andy. So I never got to see Wally again until the, those ready days. And I can remember just by then, I'd had a pretty good career and he had a bit more respect for me then. And with our Burnley side had knocked him out when he was at Brentford. We knocked him out the FA Cup and I scored. I set one up and scored. So, yeah, by the time we, we got to Reading, I was an experience, probably one of the most experienced players. We, we got on great after that, but he, he, he was a character, Wally, no doubt about it. Yeah, Johnny, do you want to come back in? Yeah, yeah, like I was saying, like, those days, like, you know, you as a player in that, that team, you know, like you say, the first game, you know, we've spoken to a lot of guys, you lose that first game of the season. What are you thinking? And then, then that run, just talk, like, as you as a player, it, I think, was it Brighton we beat? The next went game. down to Brighton to start yeah. and need there. It, well, when, how does it how does it go to where it went as players at the, at the time as well? When I can remember going back and we, we had, we'd lost um we'd lost Foz, we'd lost Ricky Newman, Lloyd Wusu, Dean Morgan. Yeah, there was a couple of others as well, and we hadn't really replaced them. So now it's well, what's going to happen? As uh, there was a, a few sort of rumours, a bit of talk as the chairman because he's got the ump, because of the way we finished, has he given up a bit? And 
is he a, a, as interested now? And and we, we can um, have, a, have a chat with Kevin Dillon in pre-season. And we were saying, Dill, come on, what, what's going on? We need need some help here. Who's actually coming in? What what what's Kevin Doyle going to do for us? Who knew, eh? And yeah. and so um to start the season as well, you lose and and he took me and Bobby Convey off with about twenty minutes to go. Shouldn't have done that. Took the two <laughs> wingers off and then you end up losing in injury time. And I, I went to the TGIs that night with the family. I'm in the toilet, two Reading supporters. I can hear them talking behind me. I thought, oh, here we go. What are they going to say? Yeah. And I turned round and they they said, yeah disappointing Glenn today and yeah bad start and I don't think Steve Coppel's the man is he and um, <laughs> now you, no, you're probably right <laughs> so yeah 33 unbeaten games later yeah, the, we, we all got it wrong didn't we and, and we did go to Brighton we were in a hotel in the afternoon had a bit of a team meeting ourselves and it, there was a bit of talk like come on we need this for the gaffer already under a bit of pressure if we had a loss we were going up to Preston who weren't a good team for us as well with like Preston were a good side in the championship back then. It, we, we were looking, if we'd have got beat at Brighton, could have easily lost the first three and, and Cops might have even been gone. So it just shows a just incredible turnaround, wasn't it? W- w- one at Brighton, went up and played really well at Preston. That was a great win for us up there, 3-0. L- Leroy, again, that's when you, you thought, hang on a minute, we got someone here. Two great finishes, weren't they? And that was, that was a statement win. And back on track after the first week, it was OK. Maybe we're okay, and then and then it it was only till the game I started believing we'd beaten Ipswich at home live on the Sky. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was two nil, but we battered them. Should have been six or seven. And Ipswich were always a team in the playoffs. They were a team you you had a lot of respect I think for. Foz was playing for them, then wasn't he? Foz had gone to Ipswich. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and we beat yeah we beat them two really impressive. And then it was a strange season that year where we had a couple of fixtures where we played Ipswich and then we played them about three weeks later. I think Hull was the same. We played Hull and played them about three weeks later. Just the only two teams we did it that season, which was a bit strange. I don't know why they did it. And then we went to Ipswich and you're thinking, right, they'll they'll remember. It's not long ago we beat them and we bashed them at our place. Not easy going to Portman Road. Those night games as well, the atmosphere. And, and we said, got to get through the first 20 minutes. Well, after 20 minutes, it was nil-nil, but we should have had five. It was arguably the best we played. And then you're starting to think we we're, we could get beat here. It's just in the back of your mind. We should be five up after 20 minutes. You've had these games before and then they'll get a goal and, and that'll be it. But then we never. City did score. And then we, we ran out 3-0, but it was even more impressive. And on the way home that night, we, we a long journey back from Ipswich, but we we went past this retail park and you usually have the pasta and the pizzas on, on the coach and the the gaffer stopped, right, boys? And even John Goodman, the, the sports scientist, t- take your pick and there was the, the McDonald's, the KFC, the, <laughs> the Burger Kings, all there. So you, you see sort of 20 players all going across this retail park and we're all getting back on the coach. And that's when, like with the bargain buckets and the burgers, <laughs> and it was, the, the, again, you talk about an atmosphere and, and everyone getting on well. That night, that's when I felt we, we, we're a good team here. And we're going to take some stopping because we've we've been up there before. It was ready and always up there, but always just miss out. But that night at Ipswich, that's when I that you're talking about wins, like statement games yeah. and belief. And and after that night, probably the best away performance we had all season. And the KFC that did it was it K- KFC after yeah. yeah getting back at two in the morning but full of KFC <laughs> and I, I think I might have actually had the McDonald's and the way I eat I probably had both I probably ducked it to some <laughs> bargain bucket and had a couple of pieces of chicken as well but that that was a night just the atmosphere on the way home just yeah the, m- munching on on the, the the McDonald's and the KFCs on the way home and and that that there was a uh, if I look back at that season, the Brighton and Preston, that was important to get us up and running. That Ipswich game. And then the final one was, was the Wolves. Yeah, I was going to say, that was huge, wasn't it? Demons. And go, going to Wolves, the Boxing Day, wasn't it? You're top of the league. Yeah. you got Glenn Oddle saying, well, we're going to give someone a good hiding. We should have had a lot more points. We're drawing games. We should have won. And he, he said about Reading, they've been up there before. They always blow it. And 
we we've been there. The, the great story the season before, I don't know whether you've heard this, where we were one nil down and they scored right in half time, two nil. And and we went in at the dressing room and we're all sat there and, and Cops comes in, because he always goes upstairs, doesn't he, in the first half, watches from the stand. So he, he goes up and he's talking. And as he's chatting away, giving his speech, I, you know what I'm like talking wise, but I, I can't believe I never said anything. But I'm thinking to myself, does he know the score here? And it was left to Harps in the end again, another talk of Harps. So Harps said, Gaffo, what do you think the score is? And he said, 1 0. He went, nice, 2 0. <laughs> and he went, oh, they must have scored when I'm in the lift on the way down. So end up getting beat for that game. Wolves then come to the Medeski at the end of the season and they, they beat us and, and that yeah. cost us the playoffs. So yeah. to go to, to Wolves, they had an Anderton, a Lescott, didn't they? Paul Lynch, Sir uh, Winnerving and and Sol, who we later signed. Good 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 side. And and yet we went there two nil and it was no. That did no, not not again. That this we we're, we're the real deal here. And and we were. That that just like you know you, you talk about the players that you had as characters. Um, we had John Holmes on um, the podcast recently. He was kind of I guess the opposite to yourself. He was kind of a fringe player, and how difficult for for him coming in. How was it you know for a lad like that trying to settle into a, a settled squad? If it, you it was all right. Like, yeah, uh, he he was a lovely lad, Halsey, and um, we seen him at Stoke. He was a good player for Stoke. Good footballer. It was just when you you came in, he signed, and we were just on that run, weren't yeah. we? Where the team never changed, and we never really had any injuries. It was just the same eleven, the same formation. So people like Halsey, John Oster, yeah. John Oster probably he's coming from Sunderland. He's probably thinking, I'll get a chance here at Reading. Sat on the bench for most of the season. Hunty sat on the bench for most of the season. But they, they, you, you still needed them. Still good players. Still. Um, had an impact, didn't they? Longy went missing for six months, comes in at Christmas, yeah. keeps that run going at Derby, does he? When you're thinking we're finally going to lose a game and he gets up and, and nods one in at Derby there on the New Year's Day. I'm trying to think who else. And Chris Makin. Another, yeah. When Chris Makin played, good player, could play left back, right back. But it was just the, the team, it was just when you're having a season like that, you're just so unlucky. Yeah. Graham Stack as well didn't really feature. Graham Stack, yeah. But but the good thing for John Halls to fit in, he knew Stacky and City and Harps. So yeah. he was a great lad. He had no problem fitting in. It was just a shame for him football wise. You just never got gonna get in ahead of Mertz unless Mertz got injured and, and he never. Yeah. 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 And, and Glenn, you um you obviously, you know, had that fantastic season, the one oh six season, go up to the Premier League for the first time. Um, what what were your thoughts at, at the end of that season? Was it, you know, was it all about we've done it, we've gone up to the Premier League, or were you already thinking, you know, we can do something in the Premier League? Or what what were what was the thoughts that you had about what might happen next, and what were the thoughts of the other players and the the manager, and you know, what did what do they say to you, and and what was going through your head? Just uh, the excitement that for for us. To, to go up was because not many people had played in the Premier League. That's why it was so big for us. It, it might not have meant as much. If, if you're a bit of a yo-yo team, you might get used to it. If you're Norwich <laughs> or the, the West Broms back in the day, it, it, if you've had a promotion before, you played in the Premier League, it might not mean as much. But for us, it was that excitement. We probably only had... Uh, I was on loan at Bolton a, a couple of seasons before and I, I played about 48 minutes I think I had. And then you had John Ostar had bits and pieces, Chris Makin. But other than that, I don't think we'd had anyone who'd played in the Premier League. So it was exciting, the, the fixtures. That, that's more than anything. You, once the season was done, we had the, the, um, the promotion dinner. Then there's the bus tour around the town. That was great. And then it's all about the fixture list, picking out. When Manchester United looking out for Old Trafford, the the Arsenal, the Chelsea, those big fixtures. So that that's what it meant to us because it it never and and the club as well had never been in the Premier League before, so it was all new. I didn't expect we'd do well. I have to be honest. I thought we'd probably be straight back down, but you never know. And and that's the one thing you find that with the Premier League, you just never know. You go in, 
maybe we took people by surprise the way we played and, and we had the momentum. But once we got up and running, then you're thinking, hang on a minute, we can do this. It, again, the confidence and and then it was just unbelievable. You, at the start of the season, if you'd have said fourth bottom, nobody would have played a game. And we ended up finishing eighth, wasn't it? And, yeah. and just missed out the last game. We, we were winning at Blackburn. We were about 10 minutes away from from the yeah. European place. Yeah. Uh, Incredible. Uh, when, did you, when did you sort of, during that season, from thinking we want to stay up to actually, you know, whether it was a third of the way through the season or getting close to Christmas, when did you think, actually, we're a really good team here in the Premier League? What, you know, where, where did that... Where did that success come from? Was it to do with the mentality? Was it to do with what the manager said? Just did you have a bit of luck? What? Why was it such a success that season? Do you think? Yeah, it, the, the the start was important. I, I feel a team that goes up, just the fixture list means so much. If you get some winnable fixtures in those first seven eight games, avoid the big guns then maybe you can get off to a decent start. Then there was that spell in October where they had a tough run and we lost, was it four in a row? We had Chelsea at home, a bit unlucky, lucky goal. And it was a crazy game, wasn't there, with the goalkeepers, those, the, the, the game where they finished with John Terry in goal. Then we went to Portsmouth. We well beaten down at Fratton Park. One of the best teams to play against us that season. They played really well on that, on that day. Tough place to go anyway. Fratton Park. Then it was Arsenal. We got the lesson against Arsenal. Out of all the teams in in those two seasons in the Premier League, we were competitive against everyone apart from Arsenal. They they were the team. We, we tried in different kickoffs. I think we had them on the Monday night. We had them on the Sunday four o'clock kickoff. A Saturday twelve o'clock kickoff. We tried everything with different formations, different way of playing, and they were the that they were the team we couldn't figure out. But Chelsea, Manchester United, Liverpool. We had some great results. We were in every game with narrow defeats, got some draws. It was just Arsenal, that game that they give us a lesson. That was 4-0, I think, wasn't it? And then all of a sudden, I wouldn't say there's a few doubts creeping, but it was, all right, here we go, the reality of the Premier League set, settling in. And then that game against Tottenham just got us back on track, that win against Tottenham. We went again, went a goal down. You're thinking, here we go again. This could be five or six defeats on the bounce. Turned it round, one three one, and then after that we never really looked back, and and then we had a great Christmas, didn't we, with the the draw uh, against um, St- Chelsea at Stamford Bridge, Mourinho's Chelsea, the champions, and then the the best win of the season okay. against West Ham, that that six nil. Yeah. yeah, we did a Glenn. We did a list of our kind of favourite games as Reading fans, and and Johnny and I go back forty years, and that game was on my list. I, w- I was at that game and. Um, Anton Ferdinand got an own goal, didn't he? Own goal he went in. Up. Sorry, I remember the yeah. the game, wasn't it? I think we scored a lovely goal. I, I, I'm outside of the foot to City. He's just sort of clipped it across. Hunty, that great footballing goal. And then the Shorey run, what yeah. stands out. Where he went, Shorey, he probably only went past about three. He'll, he'll say he went past about eight. <laughs> but just but Shorey was on fire, wasn't he? And got, got himself in England. Come at the end of the yep. season, at that's the end it. of that season, played played for England, didn't he? And uh, yeah, that's what stands out from from that. What was it even four? Was it four or five at half time? It's four nil at half time. And yeah. Four nil at half time ended up sitting. Yeah, we scored a couple in the second yeah. half. It, yeah, just yeah, again, that's when you know you're in the Premier League, where you're thinking that you're living the dream, aren't you? You that's can't it. believe it. You've just played. You've just and and it was the back to back games. That's when you know the fixture list came out, and you, you you're at Stamford Bridge on the 26th, and the game in between, you're up at Old Trafford, and and then it's you're drawing with Mourinho's Chelsea late on. Great game that was. It, it, yeah. In terms, if you said to me my favourite game that we didn't win in all my career, I've got. That one at Stanford Bridge, to all, and for Portsmouth, it was the the AC Milan game that finished to all as well. And best defeat was probably the game against Newcastle yeah. when we lost the atmosphere up at St James's Park. We were one nil down. We turned it round two one, and and we had we had a twenty minute spell in that second half. We came out in the second half was arguably as well as we played all season. Didn't get the third goal to kill them off, and and they robbed us that night. Really, they were lucky, but the atmosphere that night they had all the scarves. They put out about fifty five thousand black and white scarves for them all, 
and that that was a, that's a game that always stands out as a game I've lost. And I don't know whether you went up to the game at Liverpool as well that season in the cup, where we were four yeah. one down with ten minutes to go. We scored two. How yeah. we were four one down, we didn't half play well. It was a travesty how we were four one down, but then we scored two in five minutes, and Liverpool they were hanging on, hanging on. And I can remember the cop stayed. It was everyone stayed behind. We were coming off. The pitch as well, where the tunnel was, the Liverpool fans giving us an, a stand innovation. That was a great defeat as well. Probably the best game I've ever lost up at Anfield on, on that occasion. Yeah. So, yeah, some some real standouts. But then the West Ham as a win, that it was just, this it's just incredible. Again, you're, you're living the dream. And that's yeah. when I thought we were safe. We had about 28 points and that got us to about 28 points. And, and it was, I think we're going to be safe here. But just getting to the 40 points, I don't know whether, you, if you ever see this goal, but there was a game in February, Man City away. And we scored the second goal and it was a great breakaway where Sorry won a, a tackle on the edge of the box. He gave it to me, I give it to City. He played Leroy through. And Leroy, great finish across the keeper. And Siddy's just in his... And I thought, that's it. That, that maybe got us to 40 points. And I jumped on Siddy's back. And he just looked at me like, what are you doing? I, I just said, look, we're safe. That, <laughs> that, that goal, look, we, we, we're safe, Siddy. Just, we, we, we win this game. And and that, that's when it sort of sank in. 40 points that, that we, we're going to be in the Premier League again. Yeah. And, and then where, where did it... Um... Where did it go wrong the following season, do you think? Because you go from from eighth. Was it all about the fact that the other teams kind of knew what to expect or what, what do you think went wrong after that? Well, well, I didn't play. Yeah. <laughs> that didn't help. But um, I can remember having an Achilles problem in over Christmas time. And I, I was just managing it. I, I'd had a problem in early on in the season with my left Achilles. And, or was it, I can't think, no, it might, might have been my right Achilles. And I, I did the exercises, it went away. And then over Christmas at Stamford Bridge, I can remember doing a warm up and, and thinking, here we go again. This is my left one now, similar sort of feeling, but you do the work on it. You do, it's called eccentric loading, where you do your exercises and you can manage it and then you get the treatment and you, there's various things you can do to help your Achilles. But then I was playing, planning it but on this occasion, it, it never went away. And I, I managed to get through it and I wasn't even training. There, there was probably about three or four weeks. Uh, I wasn't even training, but how can you pull out? You're going so well. We had, with that January, February, I had such a great run. And there was a game where we beat Wigan 3-2, we, we beat Villa live on the, on the sky and we, we were on a good run and so you don't want to pull out and then in the end it, it got too much and I, I, I spoke to John Fern, the physio, and I, uh, the last game I played was on the, the, the Tottenham game and I think Fern, he said to me, he said, he said pull out now and he said, you, you'll be back in, in about April the 7th and and then he was right, but it was a year later it took. And so just came back towards the end. Then I played, played a couple of stu- um, couple of appearances. We lost City, couldn't replace City. We tried it, didn't replace City. Superman had the, the knee injury, came back. And we had a couple of bad defeats. Uh, Bolton and then West Ham actually then came to the a bit 3 three nil. You talk about a total turnaround. And we went up to Bolton Ships in three. So the goal started going in. And so Salt, maybe Rush Salt's back. He couldn't ever get back to, to 100%. Was never really the same again. And and so just those factors, really. Other people lost a bit of form, didn't they? I'm, I'm not sure if... Um, Doyley might have got injured as well. Yeah, Lee Roy did, didn't leave. They, they, they were all stop start, and it was just so it's a domino effect. So you go from picking the same team, there's the same players, you're on a great run, then all of a sudden it it's four, five, six people missing, and then it all all totally changed. But we, we yeah. weren't we weren't ever really in relegation trouble. It, it was sort of similar to this season, wasn't it? We, we were mid table. 
I think uh, we or twelfth, I think, in January. Hadn't really had any bad results. Beating Liverpool in December, great win against Liverpool. I can remember Harps going through, and we had we, we had another couple of results where we had some good wins, and then all of a sudden it it started to go wrong, and we couldn't stop the slide. And then just when we needed a result, we got one. You felt we'd be okay. And then it was just Fulham with the run they had. I don't think they'd won away from home for for about 18 months and ended up winning about three in the last five games. And yeah. so it wasn't it wasn't as if we were a poor team, was it? Did, did we even get 37 points, maybe? No, so Derby it wasn't were poor if, that season, weren't they? they yeah, were... the Derby were really poor and... Yeah. And there, there, there was there, there was probably about six teams all down there. I can remember Bolton competing with us, Sunderland as well, Birmingham were down there, Fulham. But it was just the trap door opened right at the end and, and Portsmouth should have beat Fulham on the last day yeah. and we would have been safe. Yeah. And just, I can I can remember getting home thinking, how have they not beaten like Fulham and, and then watch the highlights and Fulham never had any highlights whatsoever apart yeah. from the goal. They were so flat. They were. They looked like a team that had no belief they were going to win at Portsmouth, and and they did. Mm. Like we did our part, didn't we? Battered Derby. So even though we went down, it, it wasn't as though we, we were a bad team. It didn't look as though we were ever in trouble. It just happened so quickly, and at the end, all of a sudden, a couple of results went our way that went against us, and ve very similar, very similar to this season. You felt we'd probably be all right. And then all of a sudden, although six points getting deducted doesn't help you. Yeah. And and then it just happened. And it and it was just so, yeah, just just gutted. And and because I'd been injured for pretty much the whole season, it hurt even more because yeah. you you're watching it unfold. There's nothing you can do. And then you always look back and you think, even if I'd have played sort of six or seven games, we would have at least got one more point. We would have been safe. And ended up of this, the second season syndrome. Yeah. Johnny? Yeah, I was going to say that. How can you end up joining Portsmouth then, Greg? <laughs> yeah. Well, well, <laughs> yeah, well, what happened that the club actually tried to get, offer me a bad contract. They, they really tried to, to rip me off. I hadn't played for a year. I came back in January when I was starting to get fit and I was trying to get a new contract. I was told no because we don't know what we're doing. Yeah. Well, okay. A lot of play, a lot, a lot of players had signed the big contracts, and now I'm looking at it, thinking, "Hang on a minute, I never signed the big contract of the Premier League because I'd got injured." So a lot of them were signing the big deals, and then I'm thinking, "Hang on a minute, we've got relegated. I've not really played. That you've given up big contracts to players. We've gone down, and yet now I'm going to have to take a big pay cut." So I didn't think that was right. Yeah. Back in the championship, I thought, no. And then, and so the club kept messing me around, messing me around. Then Indian Derby actually came in for me and offered me a much better contract. So then Reading had to respond. And um, Cox hadn't got involved with any contracts, but he finally got involved and said, no, get, give him it. So I spoke to Cox and he said, OK, OK, Cox, I'll, I'll come down and sign. And then it was just a last minute phone call from Harry Redknapp. I was all going to go down to sign. I think it was on the Wednesday morning. I said to Nicky Hammond, I'll be in, I'll come in the training ground and I'll sign. And then that night got the phone call from Harry Redknapp. And now can you turn it down? It's back in the Premier League. If if I'd have been younger, I might have said, OK, I'm 24, 25. I've still got plenty of time. And I think Hunty stayed. Then Hunty and Doyley stayed the one season and then they left. Sonks might have left, did he? There was a few left, yeah, wasn't there? Sonks left, and, and Shorey, but it was just that when you're 32, I've missed a year, I, I couldn't turn it down. Yeah. And when you've got Harry Redknapp, in, it, it always tried to sign me, Harry, as well, in my Burnley days. And he'd always said, he's, he's, when I spoke to him on the phone, he said, I've tried to sign you three times, but never had the money. So now I'm, I'm glad you finally signed. And it wasn't as if I got more money. It was pretty much the same contract. But it was just yeah. being back in the Premier League. I've missed a year. They just won the FA Cup. I was playing in Europe, playing with look, look who they had: Defoe and and Crouch and Sol Campbell, Glenn Johnson, the, like David James in goal, Diara. The the list goes on, does it? Crenshaw, what a good team they had, yeah. and and so it was just I've, I've got I, I can't afford to sort of go back into the championship and have to play again. I've just I had to take it, but in all the times I left, 
all, everywhere I left, I left Glen Torren and I was sad. It went so well for me out there. Got them great with the supporters, great with the players. And then you have to leave because it's Burnley in, in League One. And it was the same with Burnley. I had a great time at Burnley. Loved playing for the club. And then the, the money had gone. We, we were struggling. Just about stayed up. My contract was up. I, I, time was running out. I thought I got to get to the Premier League and play in the Premier League. I got to pick a team I think's got the ambition and going to get there. Luckily, I signed for Reading. It was the same at Reading. I, I'd have loved to have stayed 35, 36 finished. But the, the relegation happened. And, and so it was just that shot. I'd waited so long to play in the Premier League. And I felt I'd proven it and never got the opportunity. Missed a year. So that, that's all it came down to. But yeah, I was gutted. I was. I, you're leaving. You're leaving all your friends, and and you you'd have the time of your life. It was just it's, it's football. It just happens where you got to make decisions, and and so it was just yeah, just had to had to had to leave, even though you, you are gutted, but you're leaving behind. And yeah, he came well, back again. He came well, back alone. Yeah, again. Well, how, I signed and Harry left after about three months, and. And so Tony Adams took over. I wasn't playing. And then Sheffield United came in for me. I knew Sam Ellis, who, who was the Burnley assistant with Stan Turnant. And so Sheffield United were up there pushing for the playoffs. And my agent rung me and he said, I spoke to Sam. They want you in and try and help them go up. So I, I said, OK, yeah, I'm not playing. Sheffield United is a big club. They're going well. I thought, OK, go there and at least play. And who knows, maybe get another promotion. But then the next day... I get the phone call again, my agent, Nicky Hammond's been on. He said, it's pretty obvious you, you're going to go back to Reading if you want. So I said, yeah, as soon as the um, Cox was on the phone, I said, yeah, OK, I'd, I'd rather go to, to Reading than Sheffield United and came back. But again, just what wasn't 100% fit, just couldn't get the body right. And and it, it still looked as though we were going to do it. Yeah, But it, it's just... Those those last couple of games you, that it just went against us again with that Birmingham game and you're thinking at home, come on, can we just win a game? And and me and Kits, it was Kits as well. Kits came back and you, it just it, it was different though. When, when I came back, you just had the feeling that the spirit wasn't the same. Yeah, and, and, and Glenn, you, you carried on playing. You were still playing non-league um, as recently as 2017. So it's not all that long ago that you yes, it, stopped playing. So Rod's got to about 42, I think, in the end, yeah. yeah. And, you <laughs> had to, you, and you had a go at management, didn't you? Wingate and Fincher. Yeah. I, I went into non-league, yeah, to, to help my friends, really. Every time I, I sort of kept thinking I'm going to retire. And, I, and I, I loved the non-league anyway. I, and then had friends in the game and uh, my friend was a manager. So I, I felt, OK, could go in and, and help him there. And then um, it, it turned out when um, I, I, I thought, fight, I'm going to give up. And then Shorey got the job at Wingate. And so he knew I knew non-league, I knew the level. I knew, they'd actually had some of the players there that I'd worked with. And so I said, go on, Shorey, uh, I'll come and help and see how you get on. It was his first job. He wanted to give it a go. So we went in there and he, he lasted a couple of weeks. So <laughs> I, I, I just thought, oh, I felt a bit bad. And the chairman rang me. He said, look, Shorey can't do it. Something's come up. And and he said, would you take over? So, yeah, got sucked in, gave it a go. I, I never really wanted to be the manager, though. I, I I'd always rather be the coach and I was player coach as well so I just said okay I'll, I'll give it a go and and then and then that was it but yeah good great people uh, wherever you're going non-league you, you always respect that the, the support was there yeah because you, you think that it's easy being a man you're not a fan Chelsea Arsenal Liverpool isn't it but to, to be non-league, they care about their clubs and they travel two hours on the Saturday to to even when, when um I went to Wildstone. We won the league at Wildstone. Great club. You're getting seven, eight hundred people, and they're taking 200, 250 down to Bognor Regis to watch the game. Getting on the coaches, driving down. So great, great people, and and great to see them. But they, they've gone up since then. Helped them have a promotion, and then they've gone up and they're in the conference now. So they they've taken it on, and and it, it's great to see because you, you you always that that just being in non league always sort of just you, you respect supporters. That, yeah, absolutely. That, 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 you're Glenn, not if, after the glory, are you? Proud of their clubs, yeah. their local clubs. Well, Glenn, if um, if we could just ask you sort of quickly about the 
the current situation at Reading. We still don't know for sure who's going to be the Reading manager, but Chris Wilder seems to be the favourite. Um, do you think he'd be a good good choice for Reading or, or what type of manager the Reading need, do you think? Yeah, he's a name. At least he has been there, seen it and done it. And having seen what's been, what's been going on over the last five or six years, some of these managerial appointments, it's just, unfortunately, we've, we've got a few blaggers at the club who we... We, we hear names, what's going on with people making these decisions. The good thing about it now is Mark Bowen, it's on him. You know who's got to appoint the manager, the, the recruitment as well. That's been the problem, is that who's making these decisions? Because it, it's not a Chinese owner, is it, that that is plucking Paul Lintz from nowhere. And Jose Gomez was Ivano Paunovic. It's just that these, these managers are coming that we're all scratching our heads. Whose idea was this? Well, now, Mark Bowen, you've got some accountability. It's up to him. Get some players in. I still think we've got a chance to do well next season. I, I, in some ways, it was a bit of a shock us going down because for most of the season, we, we looked a decent team. I, obviously, I can remember doing the radio for the, the BBC Bucks and... And we were talking about games, like 50% chance of making the playoffs here, the way it was looking. And the frustrating thing is, you see Luton, what they've done, Millwall were up there all that time, Blackburn just missed out. And you're thinking, well, what happened to us? We, we just totally just hit the wall. And and then uh, even when um, Tim, Tim Deller actually texted me about the six points, I just texted him straight back. I oh, will be all right. I looked at the league table. We just won a game. Okay, six points. That's 18. Then you're down. Six points. We'll still be all right. And then all of a sudden, by the time the actual points did come in, about six weeks later, it, it was all over for us. I, I, I never felt we'd gather. Once we dropped in, I, I, I know um, someone who used to work at the club and, and she texted me and said the six points. And I said, we're down. And she went, you think? And I just said, we won't get out of it. I, I never felt we'd had the spirit, the character, the attitude to get out of it. When we'd had a couple of um, close shaves, we, we, were, we were never in the relegation zone. There was teams always below us. We were always looking over our shoulder, but we always we were all OK. We were sort of arm's length. But this time, as soon as we dropped in, I said, no, we're down. I never felt we'd get out of it. And, and we never even took it to the last game, that. That yeah. was the one, wasn't it? Now, we're, if it was winner takes all against Huddersfield, I wouldn't have backed us to win. But mm. to give yourselves a chance, and we, we couldn't even do that. So it, yeah. it was a bit of a shock how it just happened out of nowhere for most of the season. If we'd have been down there right from the start, you know we're in for a struggle, but but we weren't. I, I can even remember the last game I was actually on the radio, we won at home last minute, what before the World Cup break, wasn't it? Yeah. And you're thinking, hey, yeah, that's all right, that would put everyone in good spirits a month off now I don't know what they did in that month off but came back and it, it was just a it was just a disaster then they, they couldn't stop the rock yeah. and when, when you look at I did a lot of the championship this season for, for my old club Burnley on the radio and the amount of poor teams I saw it was the worst championship I've ever seen and you look at what Burnley did we, they ran away with it in the end and and uh, again, there's an example, isn't it? A lot of doom and gloom a year ago. I was at the last game when Burnley got relegated to Newcastle and it was a lot of, sort of disappointed supporters thinking that could be it for us. Who knows when we'll get the chance to go back. And it was talked about the financial side and loans and the Americans coming in. New manager comes in. It's a fire sell. You lose Nick Pope and Tarkovsky. Me, that's your heart. That's what kept you in the Premier League. And then all the best players leave and then look what they've done. Mm. Total refurbishment, just players coming in, lone players doing well, breath of fresh air and got on a roll. Bit of a slow start, similar to what we did in the 106 and they did worry me for a spell because <laughs> I thought they were on for a great chance to do it. But just so similar where it all come together and the combinations all over the pitch and, and just that momentum they had and yeah. ran away with it. And, and so the amount of poor sides I saw you look at the playoff final, Luton Coventry, and yet we went 14 games, I think, at the end of the season without winning a game. How can you not win a game in that championship? It's incredible. Mm. But rebuild, get a, get a good manager in, recruit well, get some good players. We're a big club in League One. Other than Sheffield Wednesday, Derby, we're probably 
next in. You'll be able to attract players, even with the like the core group. I think in League One, they should be right up there. Yeah. I saw Plymouth this season. I saw Ipswich. No big names, really. Not many people you look at that Ipswich team or Plymouth and say, oh, I'd stick them in the Reading team. And and yet, they got on a roll again. Feel good factor, support behind them. I actually went down to um, the Plymouth game against Portsmouth. What a crowd. What a noise. And I'm looking at the Plymouth team. Don't know any of them. No big money. No big signings. Yet, you're talking about just getting it going. Momentum, belief, confidence, crowd behind you going down to Plymouth, sold out and they had one of the best home records in the country and yet stormed, stormed the league. So it shows you what can be done. And I know that, that the supporters, it is sad when I go back and do the games and you see the empty seats and and I remember what it was like when we're coming out just to seeing it fall and the, the way we had it going. And, and it is sad to see, but people want to watch winning football. And I know yeah. that there'll be a lot of doom, doom and gloom and... You'll be miserable at the start, but you win your first three or four games and you, you get a manager who people will get behind, not someone who you're thinking, really, not convinced of him. Yeah. You get players in, you can get behind, then then we can get it going. I, I, I'd be I'd be probably more disappointed this season if we're not up there than I was getting relegated. Yeah. So so if, if you're not, if, if now Bowen's in, sort it out, sort the mess out, because you usually find if if it's a mess off the field, it usually leads to a bit of a mess on it, and we've seen that. But turn it round, get it going, and if you're not beating Lincolns and and Port Vales and Exeters, then then we have got big problems, haven't we? Yeah. Well, Johnny, have, you, have you got one last question for? Yeah, well, it was one and a half. If you don't mind me asking, Greg. yeah. Go First on. of all, I just have to ask you about that goal at Plymouth. That was probably one of the best yeah. goals. Just. Talk us through just, it. Come on. Just well, I've just mentioned Plymouth huh? down at Plymouth. Yeah, just and did and you mean was, it? Yeah, no, <laughs> did I mean it? Yeah, anyone who's played with me will know that's that's one of my trademarks. Even in training, I, I used to yeah, I used to haunt Marcus and the feds and Ben Hamer and yeah, going through that Alex McCarthy with that chip in training. We've had some goalkeepers at Reading, yeah. haven't we? Come through, had some keepers, but it was something that. When it happens in a game, because you're always doing it. So when it happens in a game, it, it knows that like, it's paid off, doesn't it? And 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 we we lost to them as well. So there was that. They were the only teams that beaten us all all season. So you thought we, we owe these one. And and yeah, and another thing, the last thing that stands out about it that Tim Deller always talks about, who reminds me, someone had died. Do you remember? George Best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was the the game where you always had the minute silence. The first time ever, they did the minutes applause. And the interview after the game, Tim Della said on the day that we celebrated the, the death of George Best, you scored a goal that he'd even be proud of. So that's yeah. another thing that sticks out from the game. But yeah, it's, it's not often, if you actually see the goal, the video, you, there's actually Plymouth supporters even clapping it. And and I and I, I, think, I can't remember who told me, someone, one of our boys sat in the stand, he said he was in with all the Plymouth apprentices and they were all just clapping and just a couple of them stood up. Oh my God, just, so yeah, what one of my best goals and favourite goals. And just finding from it, just, so what, what's life like for you now, Glenn? What are you doing? These yeah, well, I'm on the radio a lot doing the, the BBC Berkshire. So yeah, do, do, and doing the Reading games. So it's it's, it's a shame now. A bit back in League One, so I'll see see a few um, games in League One. Last season was probably the most I saw of the Championship because Burnley and Reading we were both in there. Yeah. But now it's it was good when you, you do the 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 Burnley games in the Premier League. You do the the Reading games in the Championship, and I did Portsmouth games as well. There's some games where I do in League One, so there was a bit of a mixture, and then all of a sudden. It, it Burnley got relegated and, and so it was just the championship. So now I'm back, yeah, back to see the the, the Premier League with Burnley. Unfortunately, we're, we're back in League One. So get to see a few other grounds that I've not been to. It, it, just like um, a player though, doing the commentary, it, it's great when you're in the Premier League, that the food's great, the media rooms, <laughs> some of these stadiums, like the Tottenham Stadium, going to Old Trafford as well is, is always special for me. Take the boys up there. So yeah, You're not looking I'm, forward to Leighton Orient away then? I was actually wondering, because <laughs> um, 
I, people ask me about the Tottenham, what's it like? And when I went with Burnley, did the Burnley games right at the end of the season, and it, it was looking like we could go down. And no one you're thinking probably might not be at back here for a while. So yeah, they they did fantastic to go straight back up. And so yeah, again something to just like as a player, the fixtures come out, and I'll be picking out the games when when do we go to Old Trafford and Stamford Bridge is another good one. The foods the, the foods five star Michelin at, um, at Stamford Bridge. So yeah, still still get to see a bit of football. It's better doing the commentating than actually the the management and and coaching. So it's it's easy to talk about how bad managers are doing and have to do it yourself. <laughs> well, 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 listen, thanks ever so much for joining us. Really appreciate your thanks, time boys. And, and your memories. And uh, just just to say, tomorrow evening, uh, our guest is former Reading goalkeeper Steve Mortone. And then on Thursday, our guest is former Reading midfielder and the current Slough Town manager, Scott Davis. Scotty Brent. Davis. There you go. Scotty Davis Hollywood episode. Davis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they're, they're both available from 6 pm tomorrow and the day after. And we're going to bring you a bonus episode as soon as the new Reading manager is announced. So Chris Wilder's the favourite as soon as uh, that announcement is made. We don't know when that's going to be yet, but um, looking like it might be Chris Wilder. He's he's certainly the favourite at the moment. But we're going to bring you a bonus episode for that. So uh, thanks, Johnny. And thank you to Glenn. Been really great to speak to you. Thanks, mate.